The Revolutionary War had been raging for six years, and light infantry had become General George Washington's elite troops. They had surprised the British at Stony Point and fought gallantly in the battles of Freeman's Farm and Brandywine. Now they were finally able to set up a short-term camp in northern New Jersey and had time to relax between battles. Life in camp was crude. The men were tired and were looking forward to a chance to recover. Temporary camps like these had to be functional and easy to transport. Tents were made of canvas supported by wooden poles. They could be erected in minutes and carried easily in a wagon. Equipment was carried in wooden chests with the unit's designation marked on top for easy identification. A soldier's equipment included everything from his canteen to a cartridge box, haversack, bayonet and scabbard, and other personal items. To distinguish light infantry from line troops, the standard tricorn hat was cut down and made more functional. It was waterproof and striped with fur to protect from saber blows. This style cap set the light infantry apart from all other units. Their uniforms were made of wool with pewter buttons, and they were supplied by the French government. Most were left over from the French Foreign Legion. Their double-breasted coats were functional. They folded over and buttoned tightly for warmth. When straw was available, it was used as bedding, insulation, and to block drafts from under their tents. If a soldier had them, animal skins could be used to keep warm in the winter. Just about everything was handmade, including the lanterns. Lantern poles and other camp equipment was made of iron. When in camp, duties were divided among the troops. It was important to keep a good supply of wood for the fires. Camp was always set up near a source of fresh water, which was carried in buckets made of wood or canvas. They say an army travels on its stomach, and when in a camp like this, it was usually the camp follower who prepared the meals. The only women allowed in the camp were the sergeants and corporal's wives. All other women stayed in a separate camp. Whenever possible, soldiers ate what they could find nearby. But the camp followers always tried to provide staples with their meals. A favorite was biscuits baked in a cast iron Dutch oven. Eggs and sausage were always a treat when they could be found. And when they could get it, cider was always welcome. During the Revolutionary War, the Continental Army used a wide variety of weapons from many different countries. When in camp, troops would often drill and when there was enough gunpowder, they would perfect their marksmanship. The standard uniform of a Continental soldier included his light infantry cap or tricorn, a cartridge box worn over his regimental coat, small clothes including knee breeches or overalls, stockings, half gaiters to protect the lower leg, and boots or shoes for those soldiers who had them. Other troops, such as riflemen or militia, wore various uniforms, which usually included a hunting frock, haversack, powder horn, and other necessities. This is a very good representative sample of a common flintlock pistol from the Revolutionary War. This pistol um, was made, all the hardware, the parts were made in London. And you can tell by the inspector's marks that just the hardware was made in London. It was not assembled in London because there is no assembly proof stamp on it. The stock is American walnut, which even though it was shipped to England at that time period, um, because there is no final assembly proof, you can tell that because the stock is American walnut and there's no proof that it was assembled in the colonies. 
you can vaguely see the term, the word Ketland, which is the name of the man who did the assembly, which was an armorer in New England at that time period. The way this was loaded would be the same as any flintlock of that period. The pan would be primed with some powder and then closed. You would pour the rest of the powder down the barrel, put the ball in the wad, or the wad in the ball, and then ram it down with the ramrod until it was nice and tight. And once the ramrod is secure back in the weapon, you would full cock the firelock, and then when you pull the trigger, you get the flint hitting the frizzen, which creates a spark. That spark drops into the pan where the powder is. You get a flash. The flash travels through a small touch hole into the barrel and ignites the powder at the base of the barrel. When that ignites, the ball is expelled from the barrel. Most of the colonial flintlock pistols made here in the colonies are patterned after the British pistols and the British Brown Bess musket. Your British pattern pistols of that period generally had more brass than did the French patterns or other styles. You can see the ornate brass on the trigger guard and all the receivers for the bayonet or for the ramrod. Um, this is different than what you would see on your standard French style pistols, such as what the Sergeant Major is holding. This is a uh, Charleville design pistol, approximately 62 caliber. Uh, you can see that the uh, metal work onto it is all steel rather than brass, such as the uh, brown best design, even to the opposite side where it has the uh, lock plate holder on it. There is no proof marks visible on the piece or even where the manufacturer was. The pistol was the extension of the arm as opposed to a sword, which was a dueling arm at the time. They would use pistols for greater, slightly greater ranges. Uh, they didn't have, the pistol of this design didn't have a very long range as to where some of the other ones we have with slightly longer barrels. This Charleville design pistol would probably have been carried in the pocket or in a haversack. This is another good example of a period pistol from the Revolution. You have to keep in mind that there were many, many different styles at that time period because there were, it was still a rel relatively new weapon and there were different styles from all different countries. We were, as the colonies, a conglomeration of a lot of different nationalities and each one brought their own style with them. This particular piece is a French design. The ornateness of the butt with the brass with the design in the face, the other side of the lock plate with the brass is indicative of a Dutch manufacturer called Slur. Slur was very ornate with their brass on both the lock plate, the barrel. They had extensive engraving and carving in the stock and a very right butt plate and heavy butt plate in case you need the pistol for hand to hand. This Slur was commissioned by Ben Franklin to produce pistols for the colonial troops of that time period. This is um, one of two of a matched pair. These were dragoon pistols. These were horse soldier pistols. They were carried in very heavy leather holsters on the side of the, ha the, the saddle. They have a different style handle or grip and a much longer barrel. This is in the 58 to 60 caliber range, was loaded and fired in the same fashion. Now with dragoons, they were, as I said, the horse soldiers. They, would have had sabers, they would have had pistols, they were issued pistols. Some companies of dragoons were issued carbines, which we'll get into later. But the pistols were single shot. They were slow to load, they were you know, different than what we see today. And a dragoon would use this in close combat. Um, it's been written that on horseback, firing one of these, they were lucky to hit who they were aiming at at anything more than about 20 feet. So they probably had a little better accuracy, a little better range, but not much. Um, wounds inflicted from pistols of this style, uh, you really didn't have flesh wounds. If you were hit with a 58 or a 60, or the flintlocks of that period ranged from 60 to 80 caliber, a piece of lead that big is gonna do damage no matter where it hits you. So this again is, is somewhat indicative of your European style, your Dutch and British. It has brass with the steel lock plate, as opposed to a lot of the steel on another French pistol the Sergeant Major's holding. This particular piece I'm holding is of a French Charleville design. That tells us more of the design because of the, the, uh, the ramrod. It has no barrel bands on it because it is set in brass as opposed to 
set in wood. It has very little in the way of wood, um, virtually no ornateness to it whatsoever, other than it has the heavy brass uh, trigger housing and the barrel attached to it. The barrel is of plain design. There are no pr visible proof marks on it. It actually has a metal clip on the side in which to be able to carry in the pistol, and this pistol would be carried on the person in such a manner. Before the French officially became involved in the war, they were trying to stay out of it to see what kind of a chance the col colonies had. They would sell weapons to traders in the West Indies, and they would be shipped to the West Indies, and those traders would then sell them to the colonies. It wasn't until they decided to step into the war later on that we received the large shipments of Charleville muskets and uniforms, etc. Dragoons were your cavalry of the Revolutionary War. They were termed dragoons. That, that title goes back much before the Revolution. They were issued sabers. They were issued pistols. Um, certain companies of dragoons were issued carbines, which we'll have a sample of in a little bit. Um, various styles, you can see the difference between these two styles as opposed to size, length of barrel, um, different type of grip, different way they were held, and different way they were carried. Um, the Dragoons were your, your cavalry, they were your, your horse soldiers, um, very fast, very mobile, but with a pistol, um, very inaccurate. You're on a moving target, shooting a moving target, you're lucky if you'll hit one at 20 feet. Your true pocket pistol, your true Saturday Night Special of that era. This is a little, roughly a 36 to 40 caliber flintlock pistol. This is not of the same design as the other flintlocks, in that this is termed a box lock, where the hammer and trigger mechanism are all centered in the pistol itself, in the mechanism, as opposed to being on the side. It was loaded and fired in the same fashion as the other pistols. This type of pistol as I said, termed pocket pistol, or what they now classify as a derringer, could have been carried by anyone. This was a common item. Um, very common to see women at home with that were left when the soldiers left. This could have been in an officer's pocket, um, in a haversack, in their boot, that kind of thing, because they were small. Obviously, one shot, close range, very inaccurate, much over you know, 10, 15 feet, um, but still very lethal. This is a very good sample of a period blunderbuss. Now everyone knows the term blunderbuss. They think of the pilgrims, et cetera. The style has been around for a long time. This is of Revolutionary War design. It was manufactured in London and has two different proof marks. As I said before, one proof mark, a proof mark is an inspector's mark. When the hardware was made, he would look at it and say, yes, it meets his qualifications, and he would put his stamp in the barrel. Then when the final weapon was assembled, another inspector would look at it and say, yes, I like the way this one looks and operates, and he would stamp the barrel. And that was the mark of approval. At that point, the weapon could be shipped. This blunderbuss does not necessarily have any caliber. It was basically your early style scatter gun. You would prime as you would with the other flintlocks, close the pan, pour your powder down the barrel, and then depending on what you were shooting at, you could use different size shot, you could use rock salt, you could use gravel, you'd use the ramrod to seat it all down in the barrel, and it was fired in the same fashion. The blunderbuss was issued majorly and mainly to your naval troops. This was the, the, the weapon for the Navy. They were issued, they were also called carriage guns. The man that rode on the back of the carriage carried a blunderbuss. They were also issued to artillery for artillery support. It was short, it was fast to load, and as a scatter gun, if the artillery was being overrun, it put out a large spread of lead, which could disable a lot of troops. This is a very short piece. Blunderbusses were not long. They were very short. They were very similar to another style of weapon, which a Sergeant Major has, which is a carbine. The British Brown Best carbine, which was primarily issued to uh, some of your dragoons and also used earlier in uh, the 1700s uh, by Rogers and his troops. It was very short uh, in comparison to the uh, Longlands Brown Bess. The musket itself is, is fitted with a lot of brass, the butt plate, uh, which protects the butt area. It has a small scutcheon here on it, which also holds the 
trigger guard mechanism up and through with a screw. Your trigger guard is not as anywhere near as ornate as some of the Dutch and French uh, pistols and personal made rifles. It has a metal uh, lock plate that was very typical of the design. It has Grice, which is the manufacturer and the date of the approval by the British uh, Crown. And it also has the British Crown stamp mark on the lock itself. It's uh, a very heavy, uh, easily maintained lock by your common soldiers. The barrel is relatively short. It makes it easy to carry and maneuver in heavy vegetation. It is of 75 caliber. There was no attempt by the British at that time to standardize any kind of caliber. Incidentally, the name Brown Bess with the musket was the first uh, British made musket, but they left the stocks in uh, the natural wood color or brown, uh, Bess being the queen at the time. The, uh, all the muskets prior to that were all painted black. This is a very good sample of what is classified as a Committee of Safety musket. Committee of Safeties were established by various states to defend the state, to decide, decide on the best ways of arming the men for the states or for the colonies. Um, each Committee of Safety was responsible for commissioning muskets to be made. Each Committee of Safety or each state had their own specifications. Not every one followed the same design. Just prior to the Revolutionary War was the French and Indian War. At that, during that war, the colonies fought with the British. And if they had fought in that war and had gone home from that war, they would have taken their brown best with them. So it was very natural to assume that when the Committee of Safety decided to produce their own weapons, the most logical thing to copy was what they had, which would have been the brown best. You can tell by the way the barrel on this weapon is attached to the stock with pins through the stock. That is a brown best design. There are no heavy barrel bands like the French muskets that came later on in the war. The lock plate for this one, this is a Massachusetts Committee of Safety musket. It was made in Canton, Massachusetts by a T. French. And you can tell by the inspector's marks on the top of this barrel that it is a Massachusetts Committee of Safety. Now, as I said, size, length, caliber, all varied from state to state because the Committee of Safeties did not do a uniform design. Each one varied. This is patterned after the short land bound brown bass, which had a 42 inch barrel, as opposed to the long land brown bass, which had a 46 inch barrel. The Sergeant Major has another sample of carbines of that area as a French model. This is a French style carbine, the Charleville carbine. It was cut down version of the exact uh, full size musket. It has the standard lock system onto it as the Charleville. It even has the Charleville name and the French flechette onto it for the uh, uh, approval. The lock is very simple in design, very easy to maintain by the common soldier. The hardware and so on on the musket is of all steel. It has a steel rather than brass. They use much more steel. In fact, they use very little in the way of brass on them. The uh, Your hand guards, your butt plates, it has the barrel bands rather than the pins of the, uh, the British Brown Bess. It has the large band at the, at the front, which also helps to hold the ramrod in, as well as hold the uh, wood stock to the barrel. Uh, depending on the powder charge in them used, as uh, nearly the same range as a full-size Charleville. Uh, even though the barrel is short, it is of a smooth bore design, uh, which makes it easier to load but also cuts down on your accurate range of the piece. This is a model 1763 French Charleville musket. It's a 69 caliber smooth bore. These were issued to the colonial troops from a procurement from the French government. The French upgraded their weapons in 1777 and basically cleaned out their warehouses and gave us, the colonial troops, the model 1763s. This weapon is loaded, as we described. The soldier would get a cartridge from his cartridge box. The cartridges were wrapped paper of the diameter, the caliber of the ball. They contain the powder, the ball is at the base, and the end is waxed. The wax acts as a water sealant and as a lubricant for the ball in the barrel.
The soldier would bite the cartridge at the fold and tear it open. At this point, the cartridge is open with the powder inside. Now a small portion of powder is poured into the pan, and the pan is closed with the frizzen. This is what creates the spark when the flint strikes it. When the hammer comes forward and strikes this, the spark opens the pan, the hammer opens the pan and a spark falls into the powder. After the soldier closed the pan, he would then lower the musket and pour the rest of the powder down the barrel and just follow it by stuffing the ball in. The paper acts as a wad. The wax lubricates and you tamp it home. Return the ramrod to its place. Now, depending on the battle and the type of fighting to be done, the soldier would then be told to either wait, shoulder his musket, march, run, whatever, or he could be given the command to make ready, at which point he full cocks the firelock and would step back, the command for take aim, and on the command to fire, fires, at which point he is now ready to reload and fire again. What I have here is a 50 caliber rifle, which is loaded considerably different than that of the smoothbore musket. You load it simply by, you start off with your powder horn. Look, uh, there's numerous different ways of measuring your powder. I have a brass fixture on the end of it, which I hold my finger over, press the button, and a measured amount of powder comes out of the, and is held onto the end of it. You pour that in the barrel, you then have your measured powder down the barrel. I have a loading block, which is simply press laid on top of the muzzle of the barrel. And you, you, the uh, musket balls are located in here, as well as the patch and lubricant uh, on, the, on the patch already. You simply take your ball starter, and you can push it right down the barrel. One simple procedure. Do you then have to return your ball starter back to your uh, equipment bag, you draw your ramrod, cast it about, and you can ram your ball down. Now, as I ram my ball down, you can see the ramrod has a slight turn to it. That means that it's going down the rent lands and grooves of the, of the rifle. You return the ramrod. Now, to prime it, which is the last step to do on a rifle as opposed to a musket, you have a small priming flask of various different kinds. This one is slightly brass. It has a much finer powder in it. I simply press the end of it, and a small amount of powder comes out into the, into the pan. You close the pan. It is now ready to fire. I full cock it. Now, with the set triggers, I have to pull the back trigger first to set the front one, which is what actually goes off, and just put pressure on it. It will go off. There was a big comparison between riflemen and militia that used the rifles during the Revolution and your Continental Line troops that had smoothbore muskets like this. The riflemen had a very superior role as far as distance and accuracy with their rifles, whereas the smoothbore musket was good at a closer range and was much faster loading. It took the rifleman longer to load than it did the musket, and that is what we will show you. Private. Make ready. Take aim. Fire. As you can see, the smoothbore musket was able to get off three shots in the amount of time it took the rifleman to get set for two. There was a considerable benefit in the speed that the musket could fire, as opposed to it gave up accuracy, but you got many more shots off in a set period of time. In comparison to today's firearms, the weapons of the Revolutionary War were crude. But even as crude as they were, the flintlocks proved that they were a weapon of destruction. Takes aim, and on the command to fire, 
Today, 200 years later, they are classics that are gaining in popularity, both as collectibles and sporting arms. The Army often had civilians traveling with it, and although they were not in uniform and not paid by the government, they often ate and socialized with the troops. Many were land agents or purveyors who traveled by foot and had to carry their own personal belongings with them. Traveling in the 18th century, you had to have everything with you that you were going to need or you simply did without. Whenever I travel on foot, I carry two items with me that are really important. My bedroll, which is a single blanket rolled up, strapped to my back. And I carry my haversack, which is my kitchen and uh, how I prepare and maintain all my, my food. Uh, I might also carry a sh spare shirt or something like that in here. I also carry a notebook. This is useful for keeping all the transactions that I incur from uh, buying land grants from people and I can also keep notes in it on uh, when I incur a debt so that when my lawyers back in Boston get the bill they know that, uh, that uh, I actually did stay at this or that tavern. When I'm traveling alone I usually have to eat alone. That means I have to start a fire somewhere and this is my fire starting kit. And the only way to start a fire in the 18th century was with flint and steel. These are pieces of flint. When you want to, when you want to strike a fire, you hold the, the steel in one hand and you strike the flint against it in a downward arc and that peels off little pieces of the steel and it turns red hot. What I drop the spark into is called uh, char. This is char wood. You can also use char cloth. It's like charcoal made at home. And when the spark will land on that, it will stay and it'll start to glow. And pretty soon that whole piece of char is a, a red hot ember. If I am out and I have my fire started, I need something to cook my meal in. This is called a corn boiler. It's a traditional pot for cooking corn, for cooking meals. It come, it's made out of brass and it has a tin lining so I can use it quite safely and I don't have to worry about whatever nasty stuff does to you. In here, in, I carry a bag of what's called parched corn. Parched corn is, is uh, dried corn on the cob that's been shucked off and then put into a hot skillet with some, with some bacon grease, very little bacon grease, and fried. And you wind up with a, a product that looks a lot like corn pops today. You can be eaten straight like this, or it can be mixed into a stew and softened and, thick, and it thickens up your, your, your stew. When I'm cooking on my own, I have a gourd and I've hollowed this gourd out and I use it for a salt container. Another important spice was sage. So I carry a leather gourd with some sage in it to spice my meal up with. My brass cup is a tavern style and I keep a piece of leather attached to it so I can hold it in case I'm offered a cup of tea or a cup of uh, coffee or a hot cider or hot beverage of some kind. Being made out of brass, the whole thing heats up and it's pretty impossible to handle if it's uh, that, that temperature. If I'm lucky enough to be invited to dinner at somebody's house, I would be expected to bring my own bowl because they wouldn't have an extra bowl to, to feed me. And I would have my own utensil. Uh, this is an original uh, early 19th or late 18th century spoon made out of a cow horn. Uh, the cow horn was split open and then carved into the shape of a spoon, boiled in water, and then put into a mold 
to give it its concave and convex shape. These are the two implements that I would use if invited into your house for dinner. Uh, if somebody offers me a cup of tea or coffee, I have sugar in my sugar horn, which is part of a cow horn that's been cut off and plugged at both ends, and a hole drilled in the top for a pouring spout. And uh, I also carry in this bag, in my haversack, this bullet bag. This was made from the scrotum of a bull, and it was tanned, and uh, I carry extra bullets in here. And every haversack has a pocket knife. Every soldier in America had a pocket knife that looked just like this.